to process information, cells need the right tools for the right jobs. In this case, cells have two options. They can produce all the proteins all the time, or they can produce proteins only as needed. Well, it's clear that the first option is really not an option. That would just be too wasteful. So cells need to produce proteins only at the right time. So let's start with our first case study, and we're going to see what evidence there is to demonstrate that genes are actually activated. The case takes the disaccharide lactose, and there's an enzyme that cells can produce called beta-galactosidase. And as the arrow indicates, it cuts the disaccharide into two monosaccharides at that uh, oxygen in the middle. So when should a cell actually produce the beta-galactosidase to digest lactose? Let's look at the evidence, the first experiment to look at gene induction. And in this experiment, beta-galactosidase concentration is on the y-axis, and total protein concentration as a measure of time is on the x-axis. So this is a growing population of cells and it, where the arrow indicates lactose was added and all along the way they kept measuring how much beta-galactosidase is present as a fraction of the total protein of all the bacteria. At the fourth time point shown by the blue arrow, if you just estimate it's about 0.25 micrograms of the enzyme out of a total 18 micrograms of total protein, which is about 1.4% of all the protein is the enzyme beta-galactosidase. If you look at time point seven, you can estimate there's 2.25 micrograms of enzyme and about 45 total micrograms as the cells have accumulated, which gives us a total of about 5% of the total protein is the enzyme beta-galactosidase. So these experiments show us that mRNA changes quickly, which we learned in chapter 2.1, Therefore, the gene encoding beta-galactosidase is activated by the sugar and accumulated in the cytoplasm. The very first model to explain this is shown here. They figured that there were two genes encoding the two enzymes, and they were off in the, presence, in the absence of lactose. And in the presence of lactose, the uh, lactose blocked the inhibitors or inhibited the inhibitors, and therefore both the beta-galactosidase was produced and the enzyme that's responsible for importing lactose across the plasma membrane, that gene was also induced. After some time, uh, some additional experiments, people refined the model and decided that, in fact, it was just one locus, one operon, that was the term that they invented. And an operon means there's multiple genes under, controlled, uh, under the control of a single promoter. And once they had that map, uh, they knew the order of these different parts of the gene, but they didn't know what LAC I and LAC O actually did. So they did a series of experiments with haploid and diploid cells. These were built or constructed by the investigators, and we'll go through this table a bit at a time. So we're going to look at the genotype, and then we're going to see what the phenotype is in the absence of lactose and in the presence of lactose. Here's our first example. We always start with the wild type control. And you can see all the genes are wild type as shown by the plus. And in the absence of lactose, there's just a little bit of the beta-galactosidase. And in the presence of lactose, they set this at 100%, the total amount of uh, beta-galactosidase produced. And the gene construct is shown down below. In our next construct, it's still a haploid, but they mutated the lac I. And this lac I, in the absence of lac I, this allele of lac I, meant that even in the absence of lactose, you got the full expression of the lac B, the beta-galactosidase. In this first diploid construct, they're both, both copies of all the alleles are wild type. And you can see in the absence of lactose, there's very little uh, enzyme produced. But in the presence of lactose, there's twice as much beta-galactosidase produced. That's because there's twice the number of alleles. That makes sense. Here's another haploid mutant. This time we have a dominant uh, lac I. And in this case, even in the presence of lactose, there is no beta-galactosidase. So somehow, that lac I is acting as a dominant allele and shutting down whatever the function is of lac O. Here we have a diploid with a mutant lac I. And again, it's dominant. And you can see, even in the presence of lactose, we still get essentially no beta-galactosidase. So that one lac I allele is enough to shut down both of the copies of lac B, lac beta. The next haploid mutant is a mutation in the lac O portion of the operon. 
And you can see there's very little production of beta-galactosidase under either condition, presence or absence of lactose. Here we have a mutant diploid. One allele of LACO is mutant, but the other is wild type, and it behaves as if it's haploid, meaning that this copy of LACO is working normally, producing the normal amount of beta-galactosidase, but the mutant is as if it's not there, it's recessive. From all of these experiments, the investigators came up with a model of how the LAC operon is regulated. LAC I makes an inhibitor, and that shuts down the what we would call today the promoter of LAC O. However, in the presence of lactose, the lactose blocks the LAC I function, removes the inhibitor, so that LAC O, which acts like a promoter, initiates transcription of beta galactosidase gene, the LAC beta. This is our first example of a genetic circuit diagram showing you in symbols how a gene is regulated. In reality, the LAC-I protein forms a homo tetramer, four molecules here, binding to the LAC-O portion of the gene, of the operon, and it actually forms a loop so that the RNA polymerase is unable to transcribe through the loop and thus shutting off the entire operon. So in case study number one, we showed that the LAC-B gene is induced by lactose. 